Good evening, ladies okay, and gentlemen. Everyone. Welcome to Black Men Speak. I'm your co-host, J.R. Stewart. And I am your co-host, Tommy Duncan. It is Wednesday night, the 15th of June, 2022, Jimmy. Yeah, so it's that means night. it's Black Men Speak. Yes, Absolutely. that means it's Black Men Speak. So we're getting a little bit of a late start today. Um, you know, our virtual studio has some issues, but hopefully we'll get uh, caught up and back on track. So, Tom, uh, let's skip some of our normal uh, introductions and our formalities, and let's um, let's jump on let's jump in with uh, Professor uh, Glover and get right to the point. Right, start talking about the topic. All right, folks. Well, we want to uh, thank everyone who's listening tonight, and again, we apologize for starting a few minutes late, but we guarantee you that it will definitely be worth the watch this evening. <clears throat> you know, we are in a uh, very prophetic uh, place in history and in time. And Black Men Speak, of course, is always committed to providing the most provocative and thought-bending topics on the internet. So with that being said, we're going to um, thank our co-host, thank our special guest today. And uh, Jimmy, of course, we're going to thank our theme music uh, mogul as well. From, uh, uh, yeah, from Liquid, the group absolutely. Liquid. So, folks, for those of you who are oh, completely aware, and for those of you who are not, we are headed into a, a double holiday weekend. Uh, of course, first for those of out there, uh, please make sure that you don't get your, you don't forget your fathers this weekend because this Sunday is Father's Day. But in addition to that, uh, for many of us around the country and especially in the South, uh, we're going to be celebrating uh, now the federal holiday, Juneteenth. So we're going to talk a little bit about. Uh, some history and some unknown things that you probably need to talk about. And of course, we have our nationally renowned historian, Professor Glover tonight, who is going to talk yes. to us about some things that you definitely need to know. He requires no introduction. He has, uh, Brother Glover, I think 50 plus some odd years, give or take, have been committed to the struggle, correct? And I think that you are on mute. We can't hear you. So make sure that you're not on mute. Take yourself off of mute. All right. Make sure I'm that you're not sure on I can mute. hear us. Okay. I think I think Professor Glover can hear us, but he we cannot hear him. He is on mute. So make sure we take you off of mute. Yeah, we can hear you. We can see you talking, but uh, you are on mute right now. So we'll go ahead and kind of fill in a little bit of airspace until we uh, get you back in. So uh, before and until we get Professor Glover's um, audio on, uh, Jimmy, why don't we talk for a, a minute or so about yeah. uh, Father's Day since we're going to be committing pretty much the rest of this show to the Juneteenth uh, weekend and its celebration. So Jimmy, um, obviously, you know, I, I, Christmas or what we call Christmas in America, you know, Mother's Day and Easter get a lot of uh, time and energy. But uh, we are asking yes, that everybody, do, Tom. asking that everybody t take the time to celebrate your fathers. Yes, and the fathers are not celebrated enough. And this goes back to one: if you are a good father and, and doing what you can to um, to raise your children to be a good leader for your household. Um, this is why time when we talked before last week, I believe on the show, I talked about the importance of making sure people understand what your sacrifices are. And this is especially um, important for fathers. You know, there's nothing wrong with letting your family know what you do every single day, day in, day out, to provide a quality of life for them. Uh, there are many times when you're gonna ask for things in return and people need to understand what you've done for them so they can be appreciative uh, and show their appreciation uh, for okay. for your effort. All right. And Dr. Uh, Professor Glover is saying that he's not muted. So I don't know, Jimmy, if there's all, anything on your side that you can check. No, it's, a, it's his settings. And he may just have to he may have multiple um, uh, microphone devices that his computer is recognizing and just recognize the wrong one. So probably need to go to settings, that little gearbox um, down below the bottom of the screen, and 
select it and then let me see. Uh, it should be to the far right. The last icon on the far right looks like a little gearbox, but that's your settings. And then go to audio and pick which audio device you're using. So we, uh, again, uh, folks, we apologize for the delay, but we will get this straightened out and we will start the show momentarily. We want to make sure that uh, we are In fact, let me, let me share my screen real quick and maybe that will help uh, Professor Glover. Uh, okay, so here's the gearbox for settings. So if we if you click on that, you can go here to all, and then just make sure that uh, the input, audio input, you pick the right device. See, I have multiple devices here I can use for a microphone, so I have to make sure I pick the right one. And so you may have to have the same issue. And if you don't know which one you're using, just go through the list until you find the one that works. Jimmy, of course, is our uh, production and technology guru. <laughs> so we want to thank yeah. everybody for your uh, patience while we get this taken care of. Yeah. Okay. So I hope that helped. <clears throat> I was going to say that uh, the professor did send me some more information, uh, the very informative uh, that kind of closed the gap, um, in my knowledge, between the, the, the importance of cotton in this whole deal. Um, and so the, the professor was correct. Uh, it looks like uh, Napoleon III you know, had an interest in you know, figuring if he can keep uh, the America divided, uh, that we wouldn't have time to uh, worry about what he was doing in the British and I believe one other country in, uh, in Mexico as far as trying to recoup their they're dead from them. So, um, so yeah, it's very, very informative, good information. Um, and everyone should understand the contribution, should always understand our contributions, Tom. So this is why history and the study of history is so important. Uh, you don't know what your contribution is and was on the world stage. And we think that our history began in 1619 in this country, but we had a long, right. rich history before that. So. Um, so, you know, it'd be good for uh, Professor Glover, Glover to uh, come on and, and help explain uh, some of that history uh, to our, our listening audience. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's that's one thing that you bring up. And we've talked about this before, Jimmy. Unfortunately, you know, when other folks are controlling your history, you have very little power. You have no power, actually, when other folks are you writing have none, Tom. history. And the reality of it yeah, is... Yeah, you have, you have none. And then if you... If you upset the power makers, the power brokers, then they simply cut you off. Um, mm -hmm. There are many attempts have been made to cut to shut down this show, you know, and we're no threat to anyone, but um, just the information that we're trying to share with our listening audience and viewing audience, um, evidently somebody thought it was too, uh, too much truth being uh, distributed here. So uh, many attempts were made to shut us down. And so we're still standing, but we need to continue to grow this channel, and we need to challenge others to develop outlets and channels um, that uh, they could do the same. So we All should right. not be dependent on others to tell our story. I mean, we 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 use that excuse for a very long time. Now is the time we start using our resources and knowledge um, to create channels and get our information out there. I would agree. See, like Dr. Know. Glover is, uh, is is logging off, and hopefully logging back in. Yes, he will be. So he, uh, before we do that, we'd like to uh, thank uh, Brother Freddie Roberts for joining on the winner. We appreciate uh, you supporting Black Men Speak uh, throughout the years and welcome you uh, to the show as always. And anybody else out there, feel free to uh, join the chat line if you have any questions or thoughts while we're waiting for Professor Glover to come back. And then, of course, uh, do feel free to call in as well or dial in at 972 Yes, Hello. absolutely. Whatever you did, we are we are back. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Told you, you can't keep a good man down. Yes, absolutely. 
Absolutely. So all it took was uh, logging off or logging back in. It's just like yeah. resetting your phone. So thank you for coming back, Professor Glover. We are definitely going to make up uh, for time. And so now, folks, it is time to start the show. And for lack of a better term, uh, we are talking about Juneteenth, focusing on the influence that our African ancestors had. But this is going to be some new information, folks, that many of you yes. are not yes. aware of our topic for tonight, freedom from Cinco de Mayo to Juneteenth. How the first free settlement of Africans in the Western Hemisphere influenced the Civil War and freedom in America. So, Professor Glover, you know, we've introduced you a couple of times. We're not going to go through those niceties with the uh, interest of time. But let's talk about the general observance of Juneteenth celebration. And then let's go back to what we're talking about when we create this correlation between what yeah. happened earlier and then how that influenced the Civil War Juneteenth in history as we know it. Well, of course, Juneteenth begins not with June. Uh, the message comes into general order number three, but we're going back to December 31st, 1862, which has dual meaning for African people in America. And one of the things that we must do as an African people in America is to go back and engage with our painful history. I've come to find that most of us uh, in America tend not to want to deal with our painful history. We do not want to deal with it. It's very painful uh, with the history of slavery, of course. And we know we have a history before slavery, but I'm talking about in the context right. of what happened in the continent. One of the things that's very important to understand that December 31st was a day uh, that many Africans would gather on that night. We may not want to realize what was going on, but uh, we were at that time very much in shackled and slavery, and many times we've never really seen these and want to touch them. And so I uh, bring them and let people hear them, see them, and touch them. Because uh, on December 31st, you they would gather uh, and, and begin to look at, maybe Jim, we've talked about this before, uh, and be praying for uh, not being sold the next day uh, because we were property, you see. Right. And so you had to reconcile that at the end of the year, beginning the first of the year. But then when Frederick Douglass, Harry Tubman, and all began the whole process of looking at the possibility of emancipation, then you begin to look at this another a wartime act, an executive order by President Lincoln, who was very ambiguous about this whole issue. We know that. Yeah, but we do was. know that the uh, Emancipation Proclamation was an order given for those uh, Africans enslaved in states in rebellion against the Union. And uh, some they even talked about in uh, in the Congress talking about it was not about uh, it was about reuniting the Union and all this sort of thing. But we do know that on that night, uh, December thirty first, what is which is called Watch Freedom Night, and why many African Americans today even go to church on December thirty first. That's why, because it's called Watch Freedom Night. You see, and and so therein lies the. Uh, uh, the story, I have a coloring book called The Night Before Freedom that I've written so that we sort of remember the, that night. So it's on that night we got the message on January the 1st, which is called Jubilee. So we go to church even to this day. We pray on our knees. We wait till the, uh, 12 o'clock. We get up next day. We black our peas, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, greens, cabbage, et cetera. That ties into that. It is this day that was delayed in Texas two and a half years later fundamentally yes. because of cotton. The planters in Texas, Texas was now the new cotton empire. Mississippi was it at first. Then Texas became it under um, Stephen F. Austin, who said, we can rise out of poverty by raising cotton, but we cannot do it without the slave. These were who. So he became the impresario in what was then New Mexico, I mean, new Northern Mexico. And so out of that experience, we began to see the, land, the Anglo uh, white people, from Anglo Americans, coming from what's called the Deep South to Texas to preserve slavery. Out of there came a group of men called the Impresarios. The Impresarios were land grant uh, individuals. William Peters, the Peters Colony, the word, the, uh, the town, the area of the colony we call them Denton. That's where it comes from. The colony. Peters is one of the largest ones. In, are getting 640 acres, free land coming from the deep south here to Texas. If they have a family, they got 320 acres if they were a single man, free land. Mm. And then they would bring their enslaved Africans with them who would work the land, of course. And so we see these 
uh, Cochran's and others and uh, Millimore Plantation up in Oak Cliff. And we see the um, uh, Cochran's over in Love Field Plantation. We see over in uh, Fair Park area, which was a plantation. All around Dallas was plantation. And even down the Brazos Rivers along the eastern border, but here in, in Dallas particularly. So we see that whole history now. And so two and a half years later, they received it. But on that day in Galveston, June 19th, it was not General Granger alone. It was also those men who were, uh, who had been recruited into the Union Army and who had fought and uh, who also were there with him. One of the pictures you may have seen before, I'm trying to see if you can see it here. Yes, yes. we've seen that picture before. This, this picture is named Gore. His name is Gordon. And it was taken the day he, it was just when photography was coming of age, he was getting ready to put uh, take a uh, put on his Union uniform. He ran away from the plantation, so he has become that image. His back had been whipped. Uh, again, you didn't you didn't really kill African people during slavery like we think it. You punish them because you don't kill your best work. You may punish them, but you don't want to kill them. That's property, valued property. Later on, after slavery, lynching begins uh, because we were no longer controlled by the system in that way. So. Shortly, what I'm just saying is that Juneteenth is the delayed announcement of the Emancipation Proclamation. In June, in the general order number three, it has many different components to it, but it basically said that now the Africans in Texas should be uh, stay where they were on the plantation, but get paid for their labor and then also gain personal and property rights. And we all know that this is not happening because the sharecropping system came into play and then later on, uh, we begin to see Dallas particularly becoming the largest inland cotton exchange in the world. But uh, Juneteenth is that announcement. And so now that we have a federal holiday, uh, giving thanks to many, many, many people, you know, uh, uh, who've been working so hard at this so, so for, for many years. But now we must begin to do critical analysis research around in which you gentlemen are allowing this to happen tonight. And this is, I think, very appropriate. Uh, so thank you for being you. here. Absolutely. And, you know, I, you know, because when we talked to a lot of our our colleagues and our friends up in the north and I was like, well, you know, why are y'all celebrating Juneteenth or, or getting the notice two years late, so to speak? Why, why is that relevant? Relevant? Why should we be celebrating getting the notice two years late? Well, it's, it's come up things we've heard it for years. And we always have put things in context. We're talking about a time when you, you're saying, we take that three different points. You can look at the traveling time from Washington to Texas at the time. We're not talking about cars. We're not talking about trains. We're not talking about, you know, our technology. So first of all, that should be considered right. in terms of the location at the time. Put it in con historical context in terms of geography first. Um, secondly, looking at the political uh, uh, overlay of the time, you see, the South, the North. Uh, certainly there was be, be great disadvantage for, for the South and particularly Texas. And there are different places along the way, the announcement trickled down, got to certain parts of the country before. Texas is simply the last location it is said to have gotten, you see? so. When people of northern, and I always say to my African brothers and sisters of north, I submit to you that many of our, even though the northern did have slavery, just go back there first of all, the New England states, all the presidents, the whole New England colonies also. So slavery was a part of that East Coast Northern experience, but also we see the two different periods of slavery because in 1808, the African slavery trade was abolished, you see. And then we began to see the second what we call intercontinental slavery trade, where they would go north, i.e. 12 years of slave movie, bring them back down to the south, particularly once cotton became king. And I want to submit to you today, we're in a sacred point right now. You've been hearing about the Sahara dust coming from Africa. Uh, and you hear about the word when the weatherman says the trade winds. What he really is saying is that those are the same winds during this season that they would push the ships from Africa to the Americas, that was, all this wind we've been feeling outside right now. This is a season our ancestors would take that long trip from the west coast of Africa to the east coast of America. This is a sacred time in South in Swahili. is a word called Maafa, M A A F A. It means uh, the great calamity, the great tragedy. This is our season of of Maafa. 
We should be very, very mindful of that. And when this dust, I go out in my car, I get the dust. To think that this dust, which is bringing minerals to the land, we know that the Amazon forest is enriched by, we know that our crops are by African dust. <laughs> yes. But also those winds are the winds that brought our ancestors to these shores. We didn't come here during the wintertime. This is the season of travel for our ancestors. So putting that in the context of Juneteenth as well. So when we take responsibility for the painful history of our past and begin to contextualize it and begin to reverence it, this is a very spiritual time, not a play time. And I hear a lot of people making jokes and so forth. This is a real time about real people who suffer. And we don't look at their faces. Very few of my friends, African-Americans, who I know when I show them, I have many pictures of Africans enslaved and they, many of us have never looked at them. We won't hear a shackle. You see, and everybody says, why can't we be like the Jews? Well, the European Jews, because we got to see, they look at their box car, they look at their skin, they look at tags, they look at that. We must look at our pain. We must understand we owe it to our ancestors. And I submit to you uh, as a minister as well, mm -hmm. is that we are in much of the condition that we're in today because our ancestor spirits are, are not rested. They have not rested yet. We have not done them proper reverence. We're gonna no, we haven't. I'm going to ask, I'm gonna ask you this very quickly, and I think this is probably a, a topic for a future conversation, but you said at the very beginning of our show, not dealing with and addressing our pain. And when we talk about the pain, that is understanding the history. And a lot of people, quite frankly, are afraid to study and understand our history because of the pain associated with our history. But it's a very short period of time in history. Unfortunately, many of us in America, we only look at that period in our total context of history as opposed to a very small segment of it. So when you talk about studying, understanding, and addressing that pain, why is that so important? There are a lot of folks who talk about, you know, I don't want to deal with that. That's not relevant. We're living in the 21st century, the 21st century, and or I haven't left anything back in Africa. There, when we look at all other cultures, one of the things that we find in other cultures is the ability to talk about the story, to talk about it through myth, through allegories, through all the sorts of ways. Looking at Sankofa means to go back, but Sankofa means you don't jump over, you go through. You can't jump over something, you have to go through it. And so by us going through our pain and understanding, I submit to you, I have a phrase. We were not enslaved because we were black. We were enslaved because we were brilliant. We're brilliant because we're black. So when I teach people that our ancestors who were needed uh, individuals, they were needed here to do something in this country and we had to be subjected to the worst human conditions imaginable at that time. And yet we have overcome it by being here tonight. We conquered slavery, slavery, we conquered the shackles, the shackles did not conquer us. If they had conquered us, we would not be here tonight. In our role as ministers, as educators, our role is to want in the church, memorialize, memorialize our past, reverence it, acknowledge it, understand the God who brought our ancestors through, to understand in our context of history, Dr. Carter G. Woodson wrote a book, and most of us only focus on one book, The Miseducation of the Negro. Correct. But he wrote a <laughs> second book, The Education of the Negro. Yes, he did. Yes, and he most did. people never focus on that book at all because we tend to focus on the negative side. When I say the negative side, oh, we've been that's miseducated. Oh, the white man did this. Oh, this. and we stay in that psychological cage, if you will, rather than stepping outside of that limit, lamentation of, of suffering and begin to speak about what we and our ancestors, what our ancestors overcame. I, I, I see people oftentimes because I am a farmer and I do, I, I'm, and we 
left the plantation in the fields and we looked at those people because we looked at the dark skin ones say oh those are those are plantation ends you know what i'm talking about they 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 they're in the field the ones in the house are the lighter ones and and they, those are the better ones and we created this rift between ourselves where we where we look at labor and land as a curse we look at this as a curse it is not a curse so we must do the serious work recognizing post-traumatic slavery syndrome yes <laughs> that while our ancestors may not have spoken about it but we i'm 65 years and those of us who are 65 and older who lived during jim crow I submit to you and I call upon all of them who are my age and older, we must begin to release the pain and tell the story. The men and women we know, my great grandfather, my grandparents, those stories we heard from them, we must begin to speak boldly about our history and recognize what happened, but also realize that we have overcome. We have truly overcome. <clears throat> You bring up a very good point, <clears throat> and there are a lot of folks who may say or may not want to address the history due to the pain. And obviously, you know, you have people who run away from the pain because it doesn't feel very good. But you brought up a very interesting point in terms of we conquering slavery, not slavery conquering us and or it transforming you in some kind of a way. Now, I do want to make sure because we are probably and we're going to probably take a few more more minutes. Jimmy passed probably the hour since we started a little bit late to make sure that we can dig into this topic a little bit more. And then more importantly, deal with the, the, the predecessor of uh, well, not predecessor. That's probably inappropriate. But talk about um, Yanga and who he was and how his descendants influenced uh, the Civil War. So I think, you know, we've had a good conversation or a good start to Juneteenth. Hopefully folks have some context as to why it's important, why we have to address it, not just that, but the totality of it. But, you know, most folks don't understand the fact that, you know, we're celebrating this because Texas being the final state, we could celebrate the end of chattel slavery because it was the last state, correct? Shadow slavery, which is a very important word, which is property, ownership. Owning a human being, shadow property, very different from anywhere else in the world. Very different. So that your children's children's children were born into what's considered at that time perpetual slavery, ownership by a person of another person. So, yes, the end of shadow slavery, but not the end of the sharecropping, of the abuse of individuals for, for economic purposes. And so, with that, in that context, the reason why anyone and everyone should be celebrating, not just in Texas, but in West Virginia, in the New England states, in Florida, wherever should be celebrated, because that is the literally the end of chattel slavery in the United States. And that's why everyone, regardless of where you are from or when, what state you were in or what state your ancestors in when the news was received, should honor this. And also, I do a workshop called Shackles and Keys. We must understand, we see these symbols now. I'm watching them on church where we see uh, two arms breaking the chains, you know, and they pop uh, yes. just, as if Africans, as we pop the chains. And that's, that is not what we did. It is shackles and keys. Slavery is a dual system. It is the shackle and the key. The people who are in the shackle were enslaved. The people who were part of the key were enslaved. One physically, one psychologically. Juneteenth is about the dual liberation. You don't break these. That's the, you don't you don't pop these or loose. There is a key and a key to every shackle. The top of the shackles have a different number than the bottom of the shackle. There were, there were many keys, is my point. So when I speak to white individuals, this is as much a part of their liberation as well as a part of our liberation. How so? Because the key, the key is the person who is 
holding the key here is as much a part of the system of slavery as the person who is in the shackle. And as yeah. you can see in your in your in your face and others, you struggle with that. There is no system without both of these, sir. Mm -hmm. And we as men, black men, we must come to understand that. Because the heart of slavery had to do with the strength of the African male who had to clear the land, who had to dig the, the trenches back in those days. Yes, women were, but men were the principal labor force. Okay. So therein, to take that man and first to capture him, to put him into his shackles, beat him down, and then to lock him down, you see? Now, what I'm doing right now will make some men uncomfortable, make people uncomfortable. But yes, you have to lock them down. And so the person who's doing the what? The locking. Mm -hmm. Right here. There's a relationship, sir. That is a relationship. And what I do is say, we know about our pain and our struggle. But we also must know about the benefits that came as a result of the key. And ultimately, freedom from shadow slavery meant ultimately the opening of the shackle. A noise. Okay. Yeah. Let's uh let's talk about Cinco de Mayo um, Yanka. a little bit. Yanka. Yanka. And his descendants and the um and the influence they had um of that battle had on American politics. So can you talk about that a little bit? And I just want to say for the record, Professor, thank you for the links that you sent. I did a great deal of research trying to find some answers, and you'd be surprised, or maybe you wouldn't, of how much information people tell the story, but how much key information they leave out. So so thank you for those additional links and your research. Well, here again, as but, I uh, said, Professor Freedom, is our, uh, we take the chance of our brains so our minds can work. We have to dig and dig, and that's what we do. That's a part of our work as a my work and others of us. But Yanka, uh, you. you, you're certainly welcome. You make and see this picture, so when you can't, uh, yeah. uh, Yanka mm -hmm. is the character here with his uh, machete in his arm, and which uh, I uh, I have here uh, with my hat on that represents the uh, maroon uh, and the machete, which was the principal instrument for sugarcane in that part of the country. Now, who is Yonka? Yonka is a Gabon uh, prince of royalty who was captured on the coast of West Africa, French-speaking West Africa, and brought to the Americas in the 1600s to what was then New Spain. Uh, in up coming here, just like in Jamaica, he was both a, uh, a farmer and a fighter. And as we talk about black men, we must understand that. Men are both farmers. We work with our hands, clear the fields. But when it's time to protect our land and our families, we're warriors. Warriors are names that we're not comfortable with as African Americans, men. But warriors are part, very much a part of the reality of any culture in terms of its protecting of itself. So when they brought him and the other men and women here, they were able to fight off uh, the Spaniards, and then go to a place called Star Mountain, which is the highest peak in, peak, yes. in Mexico. Mountain, yes. And so there, they built a maroon settlement, just like the Jamaican maroons. This is very important. And so I have a map here, too. Uh, you probably can't see it. Uh, oh, it's, it's very different. But in Mexico, you have some, what is called Underground Railroad uh towns that were near the border of Texas and on the coast of Mexico. But here you have Yonka being involved through a port called Veracruz. Veracruz is right here on the uh, eastern side of Mexico here. And right next to it is Pueblo. I put both of them right next. See, they're right here. So the two underground railroad town cities that we see are very the far removed from these two towns. So what happens in at the Battle of Pueblo uh, on May 5th, uh, 1862, was that the French, again, as you said earlier, was trying to collect the debt and so forth and things, but also they were attempting to exchange cotton for guns. 
Yes. As a result of that day, and what I kept looking for, because they kept saying these ragtag farmers, and I just couldn't get in my head, a ragtag farmer with these straw hats on their head came down onto mountains. Until I began to go through the technology and what I found were these black face, hard black face men and women being reenacted during the Cinco de Mayo celebration in, the, in, in this town of Pueblo. Now, who are these black face people? I submitted to, I share with you, you can go to a reenactment. I'm not sure if you found that, but you can pull up a reenactment, any of you listening. Look for the reenactment, the Battle of Pueblo, and you will find these black face people with machetes and guns, and they were guerrilla warfare, and they were the, they made a significant difference on that day because the French were not able to sell guns, the conf I mean, yes, the Confederacy was not able to get guns, and the conf uh, and the uh, French were not able to get cotton. Cotton is very important, major commerce. So that gave the Union Army time to regroup, realign itself, which led ultimately to the victory by the Union Army of the Civil War. What okay, my Professor, before you go, before you go too much further. Since you spoke about the reenactment, let's uh, let's play that for the people, and Thank then you. you can explain what you saw that caused you to uh, continue to research this further. Thank and you. let's say that before we play it that uh, this uh, was owned by the uh, Voice of America, which is a U.S. government corporation. So we give credit to them for the fair use of this product. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Uh, Judge, yes. uh, let me ask, first of all, did you all see the black faces? Yes. Okay. Did you see? Yes. Did you see the. And people black? who are not black with black face, black people and people with black face. Yes. Yes. You saw, you saw the, what was my point? You saw the extreme blackness of the face. Correct. Yes. I want you to make that clear an attempt to make sure that people understand that they are, we understand a reenactment is just what that is. It is to try, when you say a mm -hmm. Confederate war, the Civil War reenactment, it is to best, you can't, you're talking about whatever, we've seen it over the years, any type of reenactment, is to try to replicate the individuals of that era in that particular time. Am I correct? Correct. correct. Okay, okay. So what my uh, research is, as I looked at this, and I began to say, now, who are these people? But then as I began to connect the city, the town of Pueblo with the with the uh, Mount, the Mountain Star, the city of, which is now called Yonca Verde Cruz, it was named after Yonca, but this mm. is in 1600. But yes, 200 years later, just like America, mixing in with the people, but yet maintaining their identity. People do not understand that there are many, many black people in Mexico. <laughs> Okay. Yes, they are. Who are now I didn't realize. who are struggling now for their civil rights. Okay. Mm. So we see Cinco de Mayo really being brought into America in the 60s during the Chicano movement. The Chicano were the more radical what Hispanics at that time. So I began to splice, splice these together and began to realize here is a the first liberator. In the Americas, an African from uh, Gabon creates a maroon settlement who forces the Spaniards to give him, get, lead, to basically settle with him, build his 
area. They then called it uh, Lorenzo de la Negro. It was renamed Yanka Veracruz in 1932. And here, these massive groups of people just to continue to evolve. So I could see from a uh, context that after years and years, these individuals come out of these mountains on this day, this day, and engage in this battle that turns history around. That's not a light thing, sir. That's not. You're right. That's so a major thing. That's a major thing. And 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 it just so happened that people are beginning to now talk about Yanka. And I'm glad, you know, I, I, I started this research several years ago, but it is incumbent upon us, just like when we talk about the early uh, uh, Mesoamericans, when we think about the Olmec, <laughs> a good fr a scholar friend of mine, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, oh, in yes. his book, They Came Before Columbus, the African presence in ancient America, who yes, was sir. one of my mentors, who we sat and talked about this over and over again as we talked about the trade winds that pushed the ships of the Olmex to the West. <laughs> okay. That these were the first inhabitants of what is called Mesoamerica. These mm. Negroid features and these bold features here. So it is now time for us, and I submit to you, we cannot let our emotions override us, our intellectual pursuit. Preach on, brother. Tell them again. That's correct. We, we, we cannot let our emotions override our intellectual pursuits at this time. How does that manifest itself when you say that? When, I, when we, I have spent 43 years in Dallas. I have been a part of almost every African thing in Dallas. I started a class at SMU called Adventures in African American Culture, out of which came the Third Eye. The Third Eye brought speaker after speaker after. I was the first speaker for the Third Eye. I spoke on the subject of a theology of liberation for African American Christians. I spoke the second year in part two of that. After then, many speakers came, many, many speakers, many speakers. Dr. Ben came, different ones, you know. I mean, just I have the list of them here. And that was an excellent pursuit. My colleagues, my friends who did that, uh, my good friend Bandele at Pan Africa, my all of these, my good friends all over the city. And one of the things I find that I and is a part of it, 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 but it is a part of the reaction, is that when we talk about our presence, we become emotional to the extent that we give more time to the oppression of our condition rather than to the liberation of our condition. I choose to give more time to the liberation. I choose not to spend time talking about the white man, the white man, the white man. I choose to spend time to talk about the many countless black men and white and black women and so forth who have made it possible for you and I to be here tonight. Yes, Amen. there you go. Amen. That's where my energy is. My energy is focused on that. And you understand what I'm talking about. We get into meetings and places and we hear people say, oh, the and I understand, you, that's not negating the white man, no, other culture. But I speak it as, it is, when I talk about racism, it is not my problem. Racism is a white problem. I don't claim that's not our problem. It is a systemic problem of white America. And we must be able to say that without getting emotional about it. It is systemic. It's just like sexism. Sexism is a male problem. We want black men to speak. Hello? Yes, sir. Sexism is a male problem, gentlemen. It's not a female problem. Let me ask you this, <clears throat> and, and just a brief, the Cliff Notes version of it. When you say racism is white people's problem, mm -hmm. Cliff Notes, break that down. What does that mean to you? It's systemic. It's a systemic problem. Race, that, first of all, there's no such thing as race. It's not, it's, there's no such thing as races of people, first of all. Races of people is a scientific no misnomer. Okay, it was created by Linnaeus and the Swedish. He was a Swedish botanist separating species, and we became a species to be defined as animals. Okay, to be used by the European explorers and conquerors to be able to subjugate a people. <laughs> okay, 
Now, once we understand the use of this dysfunctional use of race, <laughs> we can understand the system that it created that benefited a group of people over against another group of people. And so that system of racism, as I use with sexism, has to be focused on a particular group. It's not that an individual is evil, bad, or wrong. It is that that system benefits a person. Every woman makes 68 to 78 cents that a dollar that a man makes. That's not that you and I are evil or bad. The system is that way. We can't change it overnight, but it's the way it is today. When we look at how today I'm doing with this, this is Juneteenth, I'm speaking at several places. When I say that Texas was built in America, particularly, particularly Texas was built on cotton, Dallas, Texas foundational commerce is cotton. Banking, everything else comes later. You cannot simply talk about the commercial cotton without talking about the millions of backs who picked that cotton, sir. The system that created it was a system that benefited white people at different levels. The plantation owner, the overseer, the man who owned the store, the man who made the horseshoes, the man who made the plow, the man, you see the family that did this, everybody benefited from it. And so we as African-Americans, I submit, have responsibility to understand the level of complexity of what how racism is. So cause and effect, simply. There's a cause and an effect. We experience the effects of systemic white racism. Women experience the systemic effects of sexism. There's always a cause and effect. We spend more time looking at the effects of it rather than understanding the causes. And for those who are still perplexed, if the institution that we know as slavery benefited one group of people uh, and another group of people dealt with the effects of it, how is that a problem to the people who benefited from it and or had a sense of empowerment because of it? How does that, how is that a problem for them? It is their pro as I said, it is problematic for us. It is not our problem. Okay. Slavery is problematic for us. Okay. It is not our problem. Gotcha. gotcha. Racism is problematic for us. It's not our gotcha. problem. Gotcha. The system is, is, I've been doing this all my life. When I say to, I'm not, it's not a bitter statement, it's not an angry statement. I'm talking about systemic realities. Mm -hmm. And until we recognize systemic realities and what Dr. King was attempting to do and other, and I, I'm a, a, a protege or follow of Dr. King's work, when I understand uh, how he breaks things down out in his language, and, and I'll close tonight as we prepare to close. And before I do that, let me just announce, there is, uh, I will be at the Marty Berry Farm on Sunday from, uh, well, it's going to start at three o'clock to nine o'clock, uh, Freedom Farm out on Hutchinson. Uh, 9455 Lancaster and Hutchins. We're going to be there. And this is a freedom farm that's been there for eight, since 1876. Okay. And we invite you to come out and share with us. And I'll be there with my drums and the free, drums of freedom. And we'd love what to have you come out. This is Sunday what evening, day? 3 to 9. 3 and, to 9, okay. And, and Jimmy, since we did start, do we have a few more minutes to close out before we wrap everything up? I know it's right. Uh, oh, no, Tom, we are. Uh, we own the show and the means of production, so we can do as we please. So, uh, yeah, we do, give we Professor do Glover as much time as he needs. Okay, we do have a question from one of our, our listeners, uh, Brother Asar al Okay, uh, one, one of my good friends. And he says, how does the professor feel about Juneteenth, now a national holiday, as a potential risk of becoming commercialized like Cinco de Mayo in some ways? All holidays. First of all, first, let's go back. All of these are supposed to be holy days. Correct. Holy days, not Correct. hollow days, empty days, hollow, empty. Correct. This is America, free capitalism, cap free profit. So it will become commercialized. I am one of the few people, if not probably one of the only person, I was on staff at Dr. King's holiday in Atlanta, Georgia, in 1986. I was the in consultant and interviewer for the first King holiday in Tyler, in remembrance of Martin, a PBS documentary. I cautioned people then, even within the family, people I, the family, I was concerned that by naming it Dr. King, Martin Luther King holiday, 
people will forget civil rights. <laughs> they will, we will not use it as a time to reassess how far we've come. And we've turned it into more of a commercial holiday. And we've not recognized that we've lost some of those rights. And we have Voting Rights Act, for an example. Juneteenth can become that same thing as you just described. Uh, people are making cups, people are, I mean, shirts, and everybody's trying to make money on it now. We know that across the country. Right. But again, one of the first things it should be is a hollow, a holy time. I would encourage all of us, one of our ministers, my brothering sisters who are ministers, who are pastors, Sunday morning should be a, a great time of memorial and remembrance calling the names of many of our ancestors who were enslaved. Most of us don't even know the names of our ancestors who were enslaved. And I'm gonna stop right there. I wanna challenge the audience tonight. How many of you know the name or names of some of your enslaved ancestors, my African brothers and sisters? How many of you know their name? I'm just wanting to just sink in. And I'm going to challenge you that if you don't know the name of an enslaved person, if you have, we got so much research now. If you don't know a name or names of your, your enslaved ancestors, then that's your homework this Juneteenth. Good point. Very good point. Good you challenge. should not, you shouldn't be asking for reparations. And I say this boldly. I've said it to me, you don't give us a dime. If you can't tell me the name of your enslaved ancestor, you don't Thank deserve you. a dime. Point. Amen on that one. You haven't taken the time to know their name, but you want to get paid. Them, where they're from, what they went through. No, no reparation. What is, the, the name. what is the best way for, for those who may not know how to do the research to find and reclaim and rediscover the names of their ancestors who have been enslaved? I mean, obviously we know the commercialization. You got Ancestry.com. I'm pretty sure you have other organizations. What is the best way to start that for those who start just speaking don't to know? Your relatives. Start speaking to your relatives. Start speaking to the oldest relative in your family. Go to your oldest church in East Texas, East Texas, wherever you're from, Mississippi, Alabama. Look in the Bibles, go somewhere. And if you don't, if you really can't find your family name, find somebody's name. Right. We must recognize this is not a game, ladies and gentlemen. This is real. And we must, we must know our story. We must feel it. We must embrace it. We must let tears fall. We must let our pain be for our ancestors. Stony the roads we trod, bitter the chastenings we are felt in the days when, I, when hope unborn had died. Yet with a steady beat, have not their weary feet come to the place for which our father sighed. Come on. This is the first federal holiday. Just like on 9-11. Let's start calling some names. Freedman Cemetery, yes. We got our dates mixed up last time. I go there every year. Nobody comes to Freeman Cemetery. I've been doing it for ever since it's been there. Well, oh, no, you, ch you challenged us, and I did go on the yeah, well, yeah. day. Wonderful. Keep coming. So, I was looking Tell, for um, you. I came over there that day before. Some came the day after. Okay. It was the day before we were, we were there. But still, well, you, come. Yeah, you put the challenge out there, and I, I, I followed up on it. I and, would agree. Uh, I did as well. I'm still, so I still want to go to your other event. Um, yes. You know, every other Sunday when you get that started. So. Yes. Yes. And I, we'd like to take a moment to recognize Miss Barbara Jones. She has revealed two of her ancestors who were enslaved. Oh, okay. Mark Kennedy Wine and Richard McNeil, Sally McBride. So we want to thank you, uh, thank you. Barbara Jones, for uh, taking the time to share that. If we start doing this, if we start saying Squire Brown, we start saying Janie Brown, we start saying Elizabeth Thomas, we start saying Emperor Thomas, we start, you understand? Yes. We start calling out. I want to challenge us to begin to call. I will submit to you from a spiritual as a man, I want to start preaching tonight, that when we start invoking our ancestors' names, 
when we stand publicly and call their name the role, we're going to be a, we're going to see a change in America because we're going to be unlocking in the spirit realm energy that has been locked up. Hmm, That's like why that. they go to 9-11 and call their names. They stand there. That's why yes. they build the walls of the Vietnam warriors and they go up there. Ladies and gentlemen, as African people in America, we must do the same. I'm a 66-year-old African-American man. I am the last. After I leave my generation, everything else will be hearsay. I lived during Jim Crow. I know my great-grandfather, my great-grandmother. I know their stories they told me. I know the names they gave me. I pass them on to my relatives, my true, my nieces and nephews and others. I have no biological, but to all of my family knows. I'll, Call their names. I challenge us tonight. I would say here, Yanka, look him up. But on, 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 on Sunday morning, call their names. Yeah, there you go. Your children, tell them their names. Cause I mean, Uncle So and So, Grandma So and So, Granny, find the pictures if you can. No matter how they look, oh, the pictures hurt me. That's they, they don't look. No, they won't look like you. <laughs> But it will start the healing process. And, and I would like to uh, call out. I would like to call out and acknowledge my great grandparents, uh, Fred and Carrie Joyner, because I know they were both enslaved. Fred and Carrie mm -hmm. Joyner. Start doing it. Start doing that's. And when we do that, Juneteenth, as we will be doing out there, we're going to be. I'm going to be challenging people from this point on. Emma Watson. I, I have a picture here. She, and I, I had because I just used it today. She was enslaved in Ellis County, moved from she was emancipated on June 19th, 1865, and moved to up living uptown with her daughter until she passed. I have a picture here. I just look up Emma Watson. I want everybody to do that. She her, her bio is there. Her name is Emma Watson. Look her bio up, look at her face. If you can't think of anybody else. Let's put Emma Watson's face throughout Dallas this week. She is a ancestor. Put on your altar. Look up tonight. I challenge everybody tonight. If you're listening to me, look up Emma Watson, who was born in Forrester, Texas, in Ellis County. She's she she, she they gave her oral history of her life. She is talking mm. tonight. I want you to look up Miss Emma Watson. Mama Watson, tonight we're gonna to let Mama Watson. If nobody, if nobody, let's tonight for this week, let's let Mama Watson be our saint. Hallelujah! Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> let Mama what Watson? Gotcha. We be have our, about be our Juneteenth saint. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. We have about five more minutes, uh, Professor. Why don't we do this in, in wrapping up? We, we've talked about a lot. Is there anything else that you need to close the loop on yes. the story of Yanka? First, so, let, me just, story let, of let, Yanka. Me, let me just close it this way. How many of you know that there are shackles at the bottom of the statue of Liberty's feet? I never knew that. There's, I didn't know that. There are shackles at her feet. I want you tonight to Google the Statue of Liberty and Slavery. It was given to America by the French by a man named uh, 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 at the, uh, in Versailles, Le Boyer. And he was an abolitionist. The shackles were to be in her arm, but they did not want that. You know about giving your tie, your hull mask. That came many years later. Right, I have that written was a, a contest. New, right, that's later. But I have written right. a new poem. I don't want to close the night with this. And, okay. And we can get i'm going to close with that but again mama watson my, i feel the energy already mama our watson, saint. All her yes come on saint yeah. mom that's our that's mama our juneteenth saint mama mama that's emma our watson saint. that's our mama watson. glory tonight that's our saint tonight you did all right well it looks this, like barbara jones did know that about the uh shackles on the bottom of the statue of liberty so it some people like do know some people do know yeah and sister barbara jones has an exhibit that was at the African american museum she is an excellent she has the exhibit of inventors by the way barbara okay. jones we work together and she gotcha. has a powerful exhibit of exhibit so tonight as we look at the lady i've given to you a new poem for our journey okay 
for the Statue of Liberty. It's called Lady Liberty's Voice. Silent her voice has been since first her spirit born. The truth of why she stands today has yet to be learned. The end of slavery many years comes now to wipe away Africa's children's tears. Open shackles at her feet speak of victory, not defeat. War now ended, freedom won, America's road to peace begun. Speak now, Lady Liberty, and tell us why you go your you hold your golden torch so mm -hmm. high to shine on all, no matter the skin, to let you know that all are kin. Embrace the light and truth you now know. Break the dam and let justice flow. Never again lock the chains that enslaved both the enslaver and the enslaved. And when in doubt as to why I stand, look at my feet and understand. Google the Statue of Liberty and slavery. And you will find more information regarding that. And we also um, have a, a text here from... Uh, Brother Roberts, he said he also he knew that about that. He also the statue was given to recognize the abolition of slavery. Brothers, to side, my sisters, this is our night to begin this week. We we must make this a holy season. Yes, we did. We must make this a holy season. Uh, the Sunday morning, I like to do this because I'm, I'm I'm going to be so busy, but I'm going to put out another challenge. As tired as I am. Sunday morning, what a better way to start Juneteenth than to be at the cemetery. <laughs> Not at sunrise, but nine o'clock, you see? I'm going to be there as tired as I'm going to be. <laughs> as a pastor, as a historian, and without saint, Emma Watson. One of the things I've been working to do is to get the names of those people who are in the African American Museum over there on the on the plaque at this at the cemetery. There's a poem there. We should have names there <laughs> who lived in Freedman Town. Miss Emma Watson's name should be out there. All the people who lived on uh, Millamore Plantation should be there. The people who live, Anderson Barner, who owned 2,000 acres where LBJ Medical Center, his name should be, do y'all hear me? Yes, we hear you. Their names should be out there. So Sunday morning at nine o'clock, let's come and call the names as we can. And let's begin Juneteenth as a holy day. Thank you. Thank you. Freeman, Freeman Cemetery, El, uh, Lemon and Hall Street, next to the Walmart store right. bring your families course. and your children at nine o'clock sunday morning and let's nine begin at nine o'clock sunday morning juneteenth spread the news spread and, the news and for those who are not local to the dallas area where the freedman cemetery is and in the in the theme of making this a holy day you talked about of course rediscovering and energizing your ancestors, specifically those who you know were enslaved. Are there a few other things that folks you could recommend, regardless of where they are, to help make this all day? Are there other things you might recommend they could do? Certainly. Um, first of all, since we're talking about black men speak, I challenge men to call. I think we said last to call your families to pray. I think we talked about that last time. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. We must become the men to call our families to prayer. Our women are waiting for us. Our children are waiting for us. Our communities are waiting for us. Uh, those of us who are within the context of the church community, uh, many people look at me and think I'm Muslim because I believe in, I pray on my knees every day. I yield daily. We must begin to see African-American men who are, i.e. the church, praying. So wherever you are, gather that this morning and begin Juneteenth in prayer. Find the old songs of our ancestors. Those songs are not just songs for the top 100. I hear that today, somebody write a song, it was the top 100. These are songs out of our struggle. Swing low, sweet charity, go down Moses. Then my Lord delivered Daniel. 
we need to hear the male voice again in uh, singing. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land, tell Pharaoh, let my people go. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Glover. We appreciate you uh, coming and sharing this with this evening. It's been very empowerful. It's been very empowering. We hope those who are listening now, those who are listening in the future, have found this enriching, edifying, and educational. Uh, Jimmy, before we close out, uh, any words on your end before we have a word of prayer? And we will, of course, defer. I just want to say thank you to Professor Glover. It's always a pleasure. Um, I always learn something whenever he's on the show. And I hope that we can extract as much knowledge and wisdom from Professor Glover while he's still uh, above ground, uh, because I would hate to have all that knowledge go to the grave. And that is why we're doing this, Jimmy. Yes. Without further ado, Professor Glover, would you, Reverend Professor Glover, if you would honor us uh, with a (laughs) prayer as we close out today's, this evening's show. Our culture, our music is as much of a prayer as when we speak. And there are songs that we must keep alive as a people. And I like to ask a collective, even yourselves, as we close out to share one of the most simplest songs of our faith and our struggle, but use it as a prayer, okay? Very simple song. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. I looked over Jordan, what did I see? Coming for to carry me home. A band of angels coming after to me coming for to carry me home. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right.